Okay, with refrigerators, at least in an idealized sense, we have simply a heat engine run in reverse. Uh, first, let me show you the uh, uh, schematic. Once again, we have a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. And this time, we st while we still have, let's see, this is held at the temperature of TH for hot, this one at TC for cold, and we have flow of heat between them. Now remember, the natural you know, uninterfered with flow of heat would be from hot to cold, second law of thermodynamics. But what we're doing is we're adding work into the system, and we're going to be able to drive the flow of heat from cold to hot. So, we add work to the system, or, sorry, we do work on the system, on the refrigerator, which is here in between the cold and the hot reservoirs. And that drives energy in the form of heat from the cold reservoir up to the hot reservoir. Now, what is the cold reservoir? What is the hot reservoir? Well, whatever you're trying to cool off. When I say a refrigerator, it's anything that um, well shuffles heat from a cold area to a warmer one. Uh, that could be a refrigerator, for that matter. Okay, so in that case, where is where is the cold reservoir in a refrigerator? The inside of the refrigerator. The air in the refrigerator. See, in the in the heat engine, we're relying on on an area that is naturally cooled to allow the heat to flow down to that. But in the refrigerator, it's something that might not start off cold. <laughs> We're trying to make it cold. And in fact, the whole purpose of the refrigerator is to make this reservoir cold. Before you turn on the refrigerator, this may be the same temperature as your hot reservoir. Well, the hot reservoir is usually the roof. So, in a refrigerator, an actual refrigerator, you know, frigid air sitting in the kitchen, you're trying to take the inside, the air inside the refrigerator, and to cool it off below room temperature. So the room, the, the uh, kitchen, is your hot reservoir. Now thinking of it as a reservoir, it's like it's, since we're thinking more in terms of uh, heat engines with these reservoirs, we're used to thinking of it, it's got this natural pool of a lot of heat, and this doesn't have very much, and so it flows that way. But here we are creating these reservoirs in a sense. Well, we're making one cold and the other hot, and we are, um, while well, with the heat engine, we rely on the fact that the reservoirs are fairly large uh, stores of energy at one high and one low temperature, uh, and so then the flow of heat between them doesn't really change their temperatures appreciably. In the case of a refrigerator, we, want, we have to have the cold reservoir be small enough that over time, by taking heat away from it, its temperature drops appreciably. Otherwise, there's not much point running the refrigerator. Other kinds of refrigerators in this general sense, an air conditioner. In the case of an air conditioner, you make it so that the cold reservoir is, in, is the inside of the house, and you seal it off so that where you dump the waste heat, that's the outdoors. So you're literally heating up the outdoors and cooling off the inside. For that matter, though, you can take a uh, the simplest kind of air conditioner, the window unit. It's just got one cold side, one hot side, and a fan to blow that uh, around. Take a window unit. If you turn it around so that the hot side is inside the house and the cold side is outside, you would think, what's the point? That's a heat pump. So heat pumps are generally not made out of window units, although you could, uh, but a heat pump that is built into the house, into the central air conditioning and heating, is simply the air conditioning run in reverse, or with the, the hot and the cold sides switched. 
so that you blow the hot air warmish. Heat pumps are not really all that powerful. Uh, but you blow the warm air into the house and you cool off the outdoors. So you can run the same unit as, a, as an air conditioner in the summer and then switch the outputs to make it a heat pump in the winter. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, what do we get from these here? Uh, remember, we're going to have the same sense that all three of these, QC, QH, and W, are positive. Okay, they're all positive. And what are we doing? How do we do work on the system? Well, we've got an electric motor running inside it. We just take electricity from the wall outlet and uh, put it into the uh, uh, motor running the refrigerator. Okay, so what we're interested in uh, with the refrigerator may be, uh, what's the efficiency? Well, efficiency. Uh, when we were dealing with heat engines, we talked about efficiency, but for a refrigerator, we talk about the uh, coefficient of performance. Now, the coefficient of performance is defined just like efficiency was conceptually as the benefit over the cost. What do you get out of it? What are you trying to get? Divided by what does it cost you? In this case, now when we defined efficiency before, uh, our benefit in a heat engine was the work that it did for us, W. And what it cost us was the amount of heat we had to suck out of the hot reservoir. In this case, though, our benefit is how much heat we suck out of the cold reservoir. And what it costs us is the amount of work we have to do. Because remember, we're trying to cool off that cold reservoir. We're trying to make it a cold reservoir. And what it costs us is the electricity, the power that we had to uh, pull in from the wall. Power, of course, being energy over time, so that the work over time is literally the power that it costs. Okay, that's coefficient of performance. The first law still applies. Even though we've reversed the directions of these, we still have conservation of energy. So, the first law says that QH equals QC plus W. So these two here have to add up to that, as I've shown in that diagram there. All right. Uh, so this means that substituting, uh, let's see, QC is QH minus W, or W is QH minus QC. And substitute that in in the, co in the coefficient of performance. Now let's simplify a little. Divide numerator and denominator by QC. So we'll get a 1 in the numerator. Okay, so if it shows, in case it doesn't show up well on the screen, I've gotten the coefficient of performance now is. 1 over QH over QC minus 1, that last being all in the denominator. That's not quite as simple and straightforward as the efficiency equation was for a heat engine. We don't really have a clear upper limit for what the coefficient of performance would be. Uh, in fact, if we're looking just at the first law alone, we can see that this can be greater than 1. Okay. So let's impose the second law. So I take the second law now. I have to turn the camera around a little bit. <clears throat> okay. The 
The second law deals with the, um, the entropy created during the process. Now, just like we had with the heat engine, remember, whatever um, heat is flowing into the system carries a certain amount of entropy with it. And whatever heat flows out of the system and whatever other processes go on, it's got to have at least as much entropy coming out as went in. And uh, you'd say, well, why can't there be just a, a buildup of entropy within the system? Maybe it gives off less than it, than it uh, took in. Well, because our, our refrigerator, just like a heat engine, runs on a complete cycle. So at the end of a cycle, it's back to the initial state, with everything back the way it was. So, however much entropy is taken into the system, here, we have to have at least as much given off here. So, that means, since, uh, let's see here, I shouldn't invoke the second law just yet, but it means that since, Delta S for a quasi-static process with the other caveats is Q over T. Then, since the second law states that the entropy we dump back out into the world is at least as much as the entropy we took in, uh, that means The entropy given off at the hot side has got to be greater than or equal to the entropy taken in in the cold side. Make sure that I've written that correctly. Yes. Okay. So, entropy dumped out in the hot side is QH over TH. That's going to be greater than or equal to the entropy taken in from the cold side, which is QC over TC. And just like we did uh, before with the heat engine, we're going to rearrange this inequality here so that we have all the Q's on the left and all the T's on the right. So, cross multiply. And, yeah, no other tricks there. Okay, so QC over QH must be greater than or equal to TH over TC. Notice the switch of the, uh, the labels there. All right, that means the ratio of the, cool, the, the heat taken in to the heat dumped, the waste heat dumped, is going to be greater than or equal to the high temperature divided by the low temperature. Okay. And the book notes, if you compare this with equation 4.4, uh, which we had used in deriving the what the second law says about the efficiency of a heat engine, the direction of the inequality is switched. And that's because we've got the heat flowing from cold to hot in this case, because we're doing work on the system. Now, if we take a look at our coefficient of performance equation here, one over QH over QC minus one, if we apply this relation into that, we will find that the coefficient of performance, which equals 1 over QC over QH, which we've got there, minus 1, that that must be should do a little bit of work rearranging the inequalities and you know, checking on that. Uh, it must be less than or equal to, because that's in the denominator, 1 over TH over TC minus 1. Which means, uh, which, by the way, you know, rearrange there, multiply uh, numerator denominator by TC, you get what may be a little more convenient. Uh, we had to make this ratio here because uh, down here because it allowed us to make this comparison directly using the second law. Not that I would have necessarily thought to do this myself, but generations of physicists coming before us have toiled away at their desks and figured out that that was the best way to do it. Okay, that means then coefficient of performance, which equals that, 
must be less than or equal to this similar looking ratio with temperatures, which we can arrange that way. Okay. So now we have achieved an upper limit for the coefficient of performance based on the temperatures, which uh, comes about from using the second law of thermodynamics. All right, that's actually a fairly nice uh, result there. So what kind of numbers might we get in practice? Let's try some. kitchen refrigerator with a freezer side to it. Uh, and by the way, if you've got a really simple, like a little uh, office or dorm room sized uh, refrigerator freezer, you notice that it's got the freezer unit on those real simple tiny ones built straight into the refrigerator part. Okay? The reason for that is that it's using the extremely cold part where the freezer is and then simply a bit of the, uh, a bit of, which is really the wrong way to think of it, but a bit of that cold leaks on over into the larger refrigerator part, and so it cools it a bit, while the freezer, which has the, the cooling um, metal veins, uh, is the coldest part. So it uses the freezer, it drives the freezer directly, and then the refrigerator, kind of the larger refrigerator portion, comes along for the ride. And that is a horrible non-physics way of looking at it, but I think it makes a little more instinctive sense. <coughs> now, but a full-size refrigerator and freezer, uh, what do you figure our hot reservoir temperature is going to be? Room temperature. So we can either round it off to about 300 Kelvin or use about 298 degrees Kelvin. Okay, let's see what we're trying to find here. I think we're going to find the coefficient of performance. Uh, the cold, the inside of there, may be about 255 degrees Kelvin. Now, to tell me the truth, I had not, uh, I'm just pulling the numbers out of the book, I hadn't looked up what that corresponds to in Fahrenheit. Uh, very often, I think, household uh, freezers tend to be, not a deep freezer, but a refrigerator freezer, are often held at... Uh, Temperature. Maybe the deep freezers tend to be at about, hmm. I'm trying to think if it was uh, just above zero degrees Fahrenheit, I mean 32 is freezing, may run these at 10 degrees Fahrenheit or less. And your refrigerator, you don't want to have it all the way down to freezing, but you might run it at about you know, maybe 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Trying to think of those numbers or what I've seen on the settings. Nevertheless, we'll use the book's numbers here. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So the coefficient of performance in this case would have to be less than 255 Kelvin over the difference in the two. Kelvin cancel out. So what's our upper limit on the coefficient of performance? You have a calculator handy? Oh, that That'll work. Sorry. And notice, of course, we get a dimensionless number because the units have canceled out, just like we had for efficiency. 0.46? No, I may have. Oh, wait, no, no. No, 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 that should be. Yeah, I'm doing this wrong. Hold on. That 
It should be larger than 1 in this case. Okay, 5.9, please. 5.9. Okay, good. That's exactly what the book had. Okay. It's nice. So, if we had the most efficient possible refrigerator, we could get a coefficient of performance as high as 5.9. Notice it's greater than 1. In this case, it doesn't have to be greater than 1. It could be less than 1, a very inefficient uh, refrigerator. Um, but we don't have that upper limit of... Uh, we're not looking at this as a percentage the way we had with efficiency. So we're not limited in any way to 100% the way efficiency was, and even lower than that based on uh, cycle log or other matters. So what does that coefficient of performance mean then? Well, we have the, um, if we read, if we look at this again, where the coefficient of performance, our initial way of defining it was QC over the work. So, uh, let's see here. Okay. That means that for every one joule of energy drawn from the uh, uh, drawn from the electrical socket running this, uh, we're able to draw say one times five point nine joules. That's how much it, that's how much electricity it's going to take to pull out five point nine joules from the inside of the refrigerator and then dump it out as uh, waste heat. Now, of course, QH equals QC plus W. So here's how you use these kinds of things to analyze what it's doing. You found an upper limit for the coefficient of performance. If we have a, a refrigerator motor that can run, or a system that can run at that, uh, at that performance, then you rewrite this in terms of the equation here, and we can say that for every, if we're dealing with one joule of electricity pulled in times 5.9, then we pull out 5.9 joules of heat from the cold reservoir, and we can figure out, given its volume and its mass, how much uh, that lowers the temperature. And then we can figure out how much, how much waste heat is dumped so we would have 5.9 joules plus 1 joule of electricity gives us 6.9 joules of waste heat dumped for every 5.9 joules of uh, heat taken from the inside of the refrigerator. So that tells us um, uh, a good bit about how these things run. The coefficient of performance can be its largest when the temperatures of a high and a low end are not very different. It takes more work to pump the heat from a very cold to a very hot uh, reservoir. If the reservoirs are very close to each other in temperature, it doesn't take a lot of work to pump them up that way. Just like on the other side, if we had a heat engine, if we are letting heat naturally flow from hot to cold and using that to drive an engine, if the temperatures are not very far apart from your hot or cold reservoir, then you don't get a lot of work out. Because it's just, it's very easy, uh, sorry, they don't flow very strongly from a little hot to a little cool. But if you have a very hot temperature in the hot reservoir and a very cold temperature here, they have a strong, they, they strongly, the, uh, the heat really wants to flow quickly that way and you can drive a lot more work out of it there. Okay. So there's a lot more work involved the farther apart the high and the low temperatures are, whether it's a heat engine or a refrigerator. One thing about the refrigerators is since we've been talking about a, a heat engine running the first, at least in principle, we'll get to real designs of refrigerators uh, in another lesson. But in a, on a uh, one note, a Carnot engine, if you physically run it in reverse, it'll actually reverse the direction each of the length is all goes, 
you've got a refrigerator. Now, this again is the Stirling engine. Um, and it turns out that a Stirling engine has, has some uh, comparisons with the Carnot cycle. It's not exactly the same, but I've, been, I've seen some proofs that there's an equi there are equivalences in it. And in particular, a Stirling engine is reversible in that sense. So, unlike, say, an actual uh, refrigerator with a cooling, cycle, cooling uh, uh, system and uh, compressors and things like that, that don't really, you can't just reverse everything on that. This, you can. If you have a hot side here and a cold side here, this thing will turn this, this direction and generate uh, and do work on the outside world. But if you hook up a little electric motor to this and turn it backwards, physically backwards, you will create a cold side here and a hot side here. So there are Stirling engine refrigerators that have been used. And I've seen pictures of them in operation where they've been able to run them so hard that they, should, that they liquefy the air on the cold side. And they've got the hot side glowing, uh, noticeably glowing. You could, you could light things on fire from it. Uh, it's an amazing little device. I've gotten more and more fascinated with these. Okay. Now, note one other thing here. Um, the book comments that the actual building, the mechanical building of engines and refrigerators had stimulated a lot of the theoretical work on this. Uh, so this is a case where the technology led the theory rather than theory always leading technology. And um, Car it said that Carnot himself, say to Carnot, recognize that for an ideal engine there must be some quantity associated with heat that flows in from the hot reservoir and flows out to the cold reservoir. Uh, this, of course, is entropy. But his memoirs, it says, his 1824 memoirs, didn't distinguish carefully enough between what that was and what we now call heat. So there was a, a bit of confusion in trying to draw out the meaning of what entropy really was. And the simple formula of Q over T, which we've been using here, uh, didn't come out until 1865. Let's see. No, no, no. That simple formula was obscured if people were not using a Kelvin or uh, equivalently the Rankine temperature scale, which had an absolute zero. Because this doesn't work out to be a nice proportion if you're using something where, like uh, centigrade, degrees where uh, zero is the freezing point of water, for example. That will not work and give you something as nice as that. Um, but one other thing is that it wasn't clear early on then that, in this being the early 1800s, that heat was a form of energy. Mechanical energy comes very nicely straight out of Newton's laws. And uh, for that matter, let's see, you have mechanical energy, um, I'm trying to think when uh, light as a form of energy was well understood as well. I can't quite say on that. That may have been later too. But mechanical energy was pretty well understood. But thermal energy took a lot longer to establish that this was energy as well. Uh, and to brag just a little bit, I found a, um, my great, 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 great grandmother, okay, was, uh, was, uh, and mixing up with a great great grandmother, um, Mary. Oh, let's see. I'm trying to think of what her married, her married name was now. All right. Anyway, turns out she was a close friend of Benjamin Franklin, and had done a lot of correspondence with him on scientific topics. And the uh, Franklin uh, Museum has a lot of their correspondence preserved in uh, Philadelphia. And he had tutored her some on science, and she had written at one point that um, why is it that the, she was worrying about uh, energy and or work anyway and uh, mechanical, mechanical work, energy, and heat. She noticed that when she was pumping water from the well, it came out a lot warmer than it was down in the well. And she wondered if it was the energy of acting in the pump was being turned into thermal energy. This is a modern way of stating it. 
And Franklin says, yeah, some people have wondered about that, but it doesn't really seem to work out. So she had, in the late 1700s, speculated on this. Surely not the only one that speculated on that. And Franklin himself says, nah, that's probably not true. So I kind of like the fact that she had picked up on that there. Okay. We're going to go on to um, real heat engines. Ah, I remember her name now, because I get mixed up with another ancestor of mine. Molly Stevenson, maiden name. Uh, later married Hewson, William Hewson, and uh, she was marrying Stevenson and Molly. But her mother ran a boarding house in London where Franklin had stayed for some years while he was uh, sent over by the colony of Pennsylvania uh, in order to try to get the William Penn family to lighten up a bit. And so when Franklin was on his embassy to London, before the Revolutionary War, a decade or so before, uh, he had lived with her. And they had, had maintained this correspondence for a long time after Franklin, incidentally, was trying to get her uh, uh, fixed up with his son, who was back in Pennsylvania, and I believe was later royal governor of Pennsylvania. But the match didn't really take. The son had come along, I think had come along, with Franklin there. So, you know, the two of them had met. So when Franklin was unsuccessful in making the match there, um, when uh, uh, Mary later wound up meeting and marrying uh, my great, 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 great grandfather, William Hewson, um, Franklin had, you know, gotten to like Hewson as well. And the two of them had done various scientific experiments together, and one of uh, William Hewson's books is dedicated to Benjamin Franklin, you know, kind of thanks for the thanks for the help on this. Hewson incidentally ran a medical school in the uh, basement of the Stevenson House, which is still there in London. It's the only house that uh, Franklin never lived in that still exists, and they've got a museum now. And had, um, when they were fixing the house up to turn it into a museum five or ten years ago, when they were digging down the basement, they uncovered a lot of skeletons. And at first they called the police, I don't know what's really going on here, and then they finally figured out that the skeletons were very, very old, a couple hundred years or so, and they figured out that his medical school had probably been robbing graves to get uh, corpses to dissect, and then quietly burying them under the house. <laughs> and then he died at the age of 35 or 40, something like that, from contracting an infection from one of these. So, but. He did, he did major work. He was the one who discovered the white blood cells. Let's see. Okay, so. Beyond that there. Real heat engine, section three. <clears throat> okay. Uh, now, let's see. Real heat engines, because the Carnot engine is not your most efficient, oh, sorry, it is your most efficient possible engine. It's not your most practical one, because efficiency, uh, despite what we keep hearing when there's any, anything about energy production, energy consumption, and cars, and, and power plants, and whatever, efficiency is not necessarily the thing you want to go for most, but power. How much power can you get out? How much energy, how much work divided by time? So if you put a Carnot engine in your car, you'd have the most efficient uh, heat engine, at least. An electric motor may be more efficient, or maybe not. Um, but it, may, it wouldn't have enough power to really get the car going anywhere. And in order to make it have enough power to do that, you'd have to build one that was so large and massive, well, it's going to carry that mass along with it, and so it makes it even worse. Or it does not help as much as you think. So, what about real heat engines, ones that are practical? As an example, let's see here. The, um, to see what the real kinds of efficiencies are, the efficiency we know must be less than or equal to the Carnot efficiency, which is given by our previous equation here. Y 
1 minus Tc over Th. And so if you have a, um, an engine, which has a, uh, the temperature of the burning gases, or the, of the hot side anyway, is 600 Kelvin, and you very likely have the environment as the cold reservoir at about room temperature of 300 Kelvin, your maximum possible efficiency is going to be uh, 50%, 0.50. So, if you've got a, um, if you've got an engine, your real engine, and it's running at an efficiency of 45%, you know what, you're pretty close to the theoretical maximum. And in practice, a lot of these are a lot lower than that. So, we keep thinking these efficiencies look shockingly low. But really, that's about the best you can get out of these things. Uh, the, Real efficiencies are not as high as we would like to think. Okay, any conversion, by the way, of energy from one form into another always involves a loss of that energy out into the environment in some way. An electric motor has, a, has energy losses as well. Uh, so efficiencies are an important thing to be looking at. Okay, uh, internal combustion engines. Our first example. We'll be looking at the auto cycle. Named for Nicholas, Nicholas August Otto, the German, who had done early work on making these. All right, an idealized version of the auto cycle P there. Here's our PV diagram. You've got four processes. Let's see. First, you take in gas. We'll call this point one here. You take in gas at uh, atmospheric pressure. So one, that's not really easy to read, one atmosphere. Okay, you take in gas there. You have the piston compress the gas. So you do this uh, adiabatically, because you're doing it very quickly. Now, in a, remember that in the Carnot cycle, you compress or expand the gas uh, very slowly, and so heat has a chance to flow through. You maintain a constant temperature, so you have an isothermal curve in the compression and the expansion. But, in practice, we don't want to sit around and just wait for that all to happen. We, we need to get some power out, so we do it adiabatically. Now, I'm going to... Adiabats tend to be fairly steep curves, so uh, this is going to be a little more, not quite as quantitatively precise here. Anyway, here is the adiabat, and of course that's all the way, that only starts down at one atmosphere. So, if we get up to point two, we compress the gas adiabatically, no heat flow is allowed. Then we ignite the gases. Okay. which raises the pressure. So you have mixed in, and I forgot to mention, you have mixed in uh, fuel vapor, gasoline vapor. Then. Uh, well, sprayed it in, it's maybe not all. Yeah, I guess it's vapor by this point. Mixed it in with that, and after you've compressed it then, you have a spark that goes off, it burns the gases, you uh, hold the volume constant while you do this. So your piston stays as compressed as it does like that. As the pressure goes way up, then you set the piston free to move, and you get this very quick expansion, which is, again, adiabatic. Heat doesn't have time to flow out of that. Okay, so now you have, an, this was an adiabatic compression. This is an adiabatic expansion.
until you get back to the initial volume, which means the initial piston position, at which point you vent it back out into the atmosphere and you take in your next uh, breath of fresh air. So that's the exhaust cycle there. Ignition here, exhaust there. And again, the area within this curve Uh, let's see here. Yeah. The work per cycle in this chapter for engines and refrigerators, uh, QH, QC, and W are all positive, and they are all energy per cycle, however long that cycle takes. So the work you get out, the amount of energy you get out per cycle is the area within this curve. And that's why knowing the equations for adiabats and for isotherms are important because knowing what the pressure is and the volume, you're able to find the uh, equation connecting them and you can do, take the integral and find what that work is. Now, to find the actual work within this, you've got to integrate this adiabat from here to here, but then you've got to subtract the integral of this adiabat from here to here. To find the, the difference between the two is the area inside that closed curve. Historically, uh, especially on steam engines, which are a little more complex often, oh, for, it, for that matter, any real engine doesn't quite go as smoothly or as uh, precisely through these cycles, these uh, steps here. Finding the actual pressure volume diagram uh, had been done with the means of what's called an indicator. And simplest case, the volume is proportional to the position of the piston, okay? And the pressure, you can actually have a little spring pressure gauge on it. And if you connect the two up with linkages, you could have the piston carry a little, pin, uh, a little uh, rod along with it, and the pressure gauge carry a little rod with it vertically, and you could have a plumber pin carried beneath between the two of them. So you could have a paper, uh, a piece of paper with a marking pen that then draws this out as it goes through the cycle. Steam engines, or the really early um, internal combustion engines, didn't run at you know, thousands of revolutions per minute, and so you could actually have the mechanical linkages draw this out very easily, called an indicator. And then, in order to find the work that was done by that engine, you would mechanically integrate this using what's called a planimeter, which is what I've been kind of playing around with lately. So, pra very practical use of the PV diagram. Okay, uh, let's see here. Other notes on the auto cycle. Okay, in this case, uh, our heat flow is here during ignition and here during exhaust. Because these two are adiabatic, Q equals zero from step one to step two and from Step three to step four. Q's of three fourths down there as well. Um, heat is only flowing in and out through ignition and through compression. Furthermore, we don't really have a heat reservoir in the sense that we did with the cargo cycle. We don't just have some hot, gigantic reservoir of mass that, that uh, the heat flows in from. The heat is actually internal, generated, heat is generated. Um, the hot reservoir, in, the, in this sense, is the burning gases themselves that are going through this cycle. So it's a, it's a different concept. Okay. However, the result of burning the gas is a gas at high temperature and pressure exactly as if it absor had absorbed the heat from an external source. So we can still analyze it the same way. Okay. Uh, the efficiency, in this case... If we have an ideal gas, um, our efficiency, let's see, we get the work produced over one cycle divided by the heat absorbed, or quotation marks, during ignition here. Let's put it here as QH flows into the system during ignition 
and then QC is what's dumped out during exhaust. It's always handy to draw in QH and QC where they flow in and flow out uh, like that, as if the system itself is the area within this. Okay, so taking that there, if we write out our equations for adiabats, take the integral around on the closed loop, uh, what you can come up with is, and there's a, pro there's a homework problem that, that deals with that, um, pretty straightforward equation, 1 minus volume at point 2 divided by the volume at point 1, which is also 1 to point 4, and take that ratio raised to the gamma minus 1 power. Remember that gamma is the adiabatic exponent. Chapter 1, Section 5. For air, it's 7 fifths. Okay. Uh, number 4, monatomic ideal gases, diatomic, and so on. You get these different adiabatic exponents. And for air, you get 7 fifths. Uh, so, what you need is this is called the The ratio of volumes when the piston is as far out as it goes, where it's as compressed as it goes, is called the compression ratio. I think I don't quite have that on the screen. Let's get that. There we go. Compression ratio. Uh, and so that's determined by the, the mechanism. Uh, he says a compression ratio, a good compression ratio, might be about 8. So you're at the widest point, it's 8 times as far as, uh, it's got 8 times the volume as when it's at the most compressed. A typical compression ratio might be 8. So your theoretical efficiency, if you've got 8, 1 minus, 8 raised to the 7 fifths minus 1 power, and that gets you, in theory, about point, uh, I won't write it down, about 0.56, percent efficiency, theoretically. Of course, you've also got friction and vibration, other things, uh, uh, imperfections in the engine that can lower that. Okay, if you want to compare the Carnot efficiency uh, operating between the same high and low temperatures, okay, he says that you can... Uh, Remember that during an adiabatic process, you have to look up all the things that are constant during an adiabatic process. Temperature times V to the gamma minus 1 is constant, and you can come up with a uh, uh, the Carnot efficiency in terms of the temperature at, let's see, 0.3, that's an isotherm, and the temperature of 0.4. And you'd have efficiency is 1 minus T4 over T3 there. For this, for the auto cycle, and, but of course, a cardo cycle, you're operating between the highest possible and the lowest possible temperature. So, of course, there's more uh, area inside that, and you have a, the cardo cycle. The cardo efficiency would be much higher. He says typical efficiency of a car engine today is about 20 to 30 percent. Okay. The diesel engine has a different cycle. Okay, uh, let's see here. It says the idea behind the diesel engine is that making a gasoline engine more efficient, well, use a higher compression ratio. 
If you get a larger initial volume and a much smaller compressed volume, you'd get a much higher efficiency. Okay, but as you compress this, the temperature is going up, which is a lot of it. Actually, the real, the real idea is that you want to get the compression high enough so that when you ignite it, you get a good, um, a good jump in the pressure there. But if you make a much higher compression ratio, let's say you compress this much, much more compactly, the fuel-air mixture, as it gets, uh, as it gets uh, hotter, it tends to ignite before the spark. And that's a problem. That pre-ignition would make you, as the piston, it's not locked in place as it's compressing. As it compresses here, let's say it gets about halfway over to your, your uh, the point where the, the piston will be locked in place and you get the spark, and let's say it ignites here, say. Now the piston's going in, you've got the flywheel, it's turning it around, and as it pushes the piston in, you get an explosion here, and it bounces back. Pre-ignition, bad thing. So. Um, or, for that, or for that matter, if you've got enough momentum behind the uh, piston there, sure, it'll continue compressing it, but you've, you've lost uh, a lot of the efficiency in that. Okay. Uh, pressure jumps upwards to point before you get to point two. So, the diesel engine uses a different kind of cycle and a different fuel uh, to avoid that. It compresses only the air, and then it sprays the fuel in it when the air is hot enough to ignite the fuel, and you don't even need a spark plug. It'll do it on its own, although they have what's called a blow plug these days that warms it up a little more and helps it. Uh, okay, so the diesel cycle Start off here. You have a, as far as I can tell, this is adiabatic. Adiabatic compression up to here. Then you hold the pressure constant while it ignites, which drives the piston back out a bit. So this is ignition. A-U-T-E-R, there we go. You inject fuel and ignite it here. And then you allow the pressure to drop. And you come back down to another adiabat. Again, as far as I can tell, that's what that is. The book doesn't go into much detail of all that. And then you have your exhaust. avoiding this pre-ignition problem by spraying the fuel in only after the gas is compressed enough to ignite it on its own. Uh, let's see here. The derivation of the efficiency is more complicated, but he says the only limit on the compression ratio of a diesel engine comes from the strength and melting point of the material you make it from. So you've got to have your metallurgy be such that you don't uh, melt the engine in running it, and you don't crack it with a very high pressure. He says a ceramic engine, and there are these modern ceramics, not just you know like a, a plate kind of ceramic, but the really high-tech ceramics that we deal with now, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of work in material science on those. And you can get extremely high-tech ceramics now that resist uh, breakage, the way you think of ceramics being brittle. They've got much better ones now, and they can get up to uh, higher temperatures. So we have, then, then metals can. Metals might melt, but ceramics are you know, more rocky-like materials. Okay, I think I'm gonna save the steam engine and the Rankine cycle for the next lesson, because that goes through uh, a good bit of work on its own. So we'll continue the next lesson with the steam engine.
and then the real free throws. 